mTOR inhibitor um, has been at the forefront of kidney cancer treatment for the past 10 years. Uh, as I allude, alluded earlier, there are two different major mechanisms that involve. One is VEGF inhibitors, one is mTOR inhibitors. VEGF inhibitors mainly work on the blood vessels. And it's kind of interesting, it's working on not the tumor cells, but working on the blood vessels. But mTOR inhibitors are actually working mainly on the tumor cells. So their mechanism is a bit different. That's why the combination of them actually is very synergistic. But in the past, when you use multi-TKI, like sunitin with avolimus, the sunitin plus avolimus is not very, sunitin is not very specific. So the toxicity is huge. And that's why the combination will never benefit. But later on, it's just avastin and avolimus is a very easy combination because avastin is easy to tolerate. So people can tolerate avastin and avolimus. And the reason I say avolimus uh, mTOR inhibitors is always should be a corner. It's part of the uh, treatment scheme of kidney cancer is because based on biology. Uh, there are so many, many evidence that mTOR inhibitors should not be forgotten for the disease of kidney cancer because the mouse model, the human trial data, and the biology, all three speaks to the use of mTOR inhibitors. And that we cannot just forget about it. We should learn how to use it in the right way, instead of saying this is um, third line, fourth line, everybody want to beat it. It's almost similar to sunitinib, now everyone will want to beat sunitinib. The role of temsorolimus as a frontline agent has been established early in the new era of targeted therapies for kidney cancer, based upon a compelling phase three study that Gary Hooties was first author of that was presented at plenary presentation in ASCO meeting several years ago and was in the New England Journal of Medicine showing a survival advantage in the poorest of poor patients with kidney cancer. That agent has a special place in that setting. And in my own practice, I utilize that for patients that have the poorest um, risk disease. Many of the ongoing current trials in the frontline setting tend to exploit their um, enrollment on the good and intermediate risk patients. So I think temsorolimus may always have a special place for that really highly selected poor risk patient moving forward. There's really no agent that has been studied more intensely in the second line setting using randomized trials than everolimus. The pivotal trial that originally got the, uh, the medication approved was the record one study, which was a randomized phase three trial that was conducted in patients who had either had sunitinib, serafinib, or both. So these were second or third line patients who were randomized at the time to receive either everolimus or placebo. Everolimus was far more efficient than placebo. The primary endpoint of progression-free survival was met, and the drug was approved. And this is now uh, uh, about eight years ago. Since then, we have had most recently uh, three randomized phase three studies that have challenged Everolimus as a gold standard in the second line um, and third line setting, uh, which adds to our understanding of how effective this medication is and how it compares to other drugs in this space. The first trial is the Checkmate 025 study, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2015, and that was a randomized phase three study testing the novel immunotherapeutic nivolumab, which is the targeted PD-1 inhibitor, to Everolimus in patients who had had either one or two TKI plus a third agent that wasn't an mTOR inhibitor. And it met its primary endpoint of overall survival. It also showed that uh, nivolumab had a superior response rate than Everolimus. So Everolimus fell short on that trial. The second study was the Meteor trial, which was the phase three registration trial of cabozantinib, comparing that novel TKI to Everolimus in patients who had had at least one or any number of prior lines of therapy. So a lot of second line patients went on that trial also. And cabozantinib beat Everolimus on every efficacy endpoint tested, response rate, PFS, and OS. And the third and most recent approval uh, was based on the ESI 025 trial, which was a randomized three arm trial comparing Everolimus alone in the second line setting to lenvatinib alone or the combination of lenvatinib plus Everolimus at reduced doses. These were strictly second line patients that went on this randomized phase two study. And again, the combination of lenvatinib plus everolimus, but also lenvatinib alone was superior to everolimus. So taking all this into consideration, the best uh, way to think about everolimus in the second line space is that it really only has a role as part of the combination regimen with lenvatinib everolimus. As a monotherapy, it has proven less effective 
than three other approved regimens at this point and is unlikely to be used by physicians in the second line space. The combination uh, with mTOR inhibitors uh, will include, I think, mainly uh, anti-VEGF treatment. And the, the good combination with avolimus will be a very pure VEGF inhibitors uh, and with least toxicity. So I can, com I, I can think of two. One is Avastin and Evolimus that we have used for the uh, non clear cell trial, and it will really tolerate. And the other thing I can, I can think of is Exitinib plus Evolimus, because Exitinib is very, very straight, easy to titrate, and very, very specific drug. In terms of uh, the other two drugs, the other drug that we have experience with is Lenvatinib. So Lenvatinib plus Evolimus is tolerable, that we know that. And the question is, will be whether cabozentinib will be um, um, a, a good combination uh, with avolimus or not? It, it's it's not known.